Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School lesson for the adults at New Bethel Baptist Church. This is for May 17th, and we're glad you joined us. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 13. If you need your Bible, it's time to go get it, or your Sunday School lesson book. The lesson title today is Citizens. Our view of government often depends on our circumstances. You know, at tax time, how do you feel about the government? Well, it may vary a little bit. Or if you're stopped for speeding, whoop, uh, that may um, kind of change your opinion about the authorities. Um, which political party is in control at the moment? Ah, yeah, that could really change our uh, view about the circumstances of government, couldn't it? Maybe the COVID-19 restrictions. You have certain opinions and feelings about government in relationship to some of the restrictions that are imposed upon its citizens at the moment. Today, we want to look at the biblical response uh, to the government. What should our response be to the government authorities? In Romans chapter 12, uh, we talked about our response as living sacrifices, that we were to be holy, uh, to live a life that's pleasing to God. That's our act of worship. As we uh, live, we worship God by the way in which we live. Uh, we are to be transformed and not conformed to the world. We're to be different. Uh, we also saw in that passage of scripture that we were to be zealous for doing good for believers. And we were to live at peace as much as is possible with us. Um, we want to live and be a peacemaker rather than a troublemaker in life. Uh, we were to live in a way that would attract others to God. In Romans 13, it talks about submitting to government. As citizens, we bring glory to God by obeying the law. God is sovereign, and he has appointed leaders. The leaders that are in power in any government are allowed to be there by God. We also see in this passage that we are to love others. Love fulfills the law of God. Uh, it draws others to God. And then finally, we'll see in this passage that we're to anticipate something better. Uh, to avoid sin, to live with hope in anticipation of the return of Christ. To, as we live with hope, we can share that with other people. Let's take a look at our first verse. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, we read, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. This word submit means to place ourselves under the authority of another or to yield to the power and authority of another. To me, it also carries the idea of honor and obey. When we submit, we're to submit to the government and its leaders. Uh, the sovereignty of God is at stake. Uh, it's God's sovereign plan that the government leaders be in the place that they are. And so as we submit to them, we submit to God. In um, the time that Paul was writing this, he was writing to the Roman Christians. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Rome was a benevolent government? Was it sympathetic to Christianity? And yet, Paul was writing these words to them. So if you think, well, this only applies to a government that's sympathetic to Christian beliefs, that's not the case. 
In this particular passage, Paul was uh, writing to Roman Christians, and eventually it was the, the Roman government was the demise of Paul. It brought his death. And yet Paul wrote to the Christians that they were submit to the authorities and to the government. The government of Rome exerted great persecution on Christians. Yet, in God's sovereignty, he allowed it to be in power. As finite beings, we cannot understand God, who is infinite. There are times that God does things that we just don't understand. Because God is infinite and we're finite. When we don't understand what God is doing or what he is allowing, we must believe and obey. When we read what God wants, then we have to believe it, whether we understand it or not. The Old Testament is filled with people who question God. But we read in Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please him. We live or walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul was not addressing a government that calls Christians uh, to disobey God. Paul did not stop preaching the gospel when the government said to. And that's not what he's writing about here. He's writing a general principle that we are to submit to the government. Verse 2, we read, Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against God, or against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Verse 2 reinforces the concept that Paul stated in the first verse about submitting to government. To defy the government, the laws of our land, or the leaders, places a person in jeopardy with God. It's rebellion against God. Because God has placed those people in leadership. They will be responsible to him. Our task is to be submissive to the government. This principle does not require believers to obey worldly authorities in defiance of God's clear commands. Now, Christians are not obligated to engage in ungodly behavior if the, that behavior is commanded by authorities. We saw that in the life of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they refused to bow to the idol that uh, the king had set up. We also see it in, in um, the life of Peter and John in Acts chapter 5. They were thrown in prison and they were commanded not to preach any longer. They weren't to preach in the name of Christ. And they said, we must obey God rather than people. So when God has given us a direct command, we have to adhere to that. But as a general rule, we need to submit to the government, to the authority over us, because God has established those governments. We don't want to let the exceptions become the rule. The rule is that we are to be submissive to the government. 1 Peter chapter 2, we see a passage that talks about this very thing. It says, Submit yourselves to the Lord's, for the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, and to command or commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men. Do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. 
love the brotherhood of believers, and fear God, honor the king. Verse 3, we read, For the rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not, uh, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on wrongdoers. Law enforcement officers can be friends, or they can be foes, depending on our behavior. The guilty fear law enforcement. If You've done something wrong, then you have reason to fear law enforcement. Ungodly officials, on the other hand, will be judged by God. Uh, fear of being punished uh, comes when we do things that are wrong. And that's what God has established government for. If the IRS wants to audit you, if you cheated on your taxes, then you'll probably fear that audit. If you've been honest and you've done your taxes properly, then you have no need to fear. Verse 5 says, Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. We submit to avoid punishment, but we also submit in order to have a clear conscience. In the New Living Translation, it says, in this verse reads, uh, so you must submit to them not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone that you owe, uh, the, uh, give, everyone, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. I've talked with people that Christians and they thought they should not have to pay taxes. But this verse very clearly tells us that we should pay taxes. That is designed by God. That's how the government is supported. Why do we pay taxes? Not just because the government said so, but that's a way we submit to the authorities and to God. We're actually submitting to God. We're obeying Him when we pay taxes. And so that's another good reason why we should do so. Why do we respect authorities? Why do we show respect for law enforcement officers, etc.? Because by submitting to them, we also submit to God. This was God's design. Governing authorities are really called servants of God. And so when we submit to them, we're submitting to the Lord. Ultimately, they are accountable to God. Now, if they do wrong, they'll answer to him for it. Honoring the government and its leaders brings glory to God and demonstrates our trust in God. We show that we believe he is sovereign, that he knows better than we do when we pay attention and we obey what he has told us to do. Submit to government. Christians should be known as people to be trusted. Uh, they should be known as people that pay their bills. It is so devastating when a church or Christian people 
don't pay their bills and don't uh, live in a way that can be trusted. Such action can be either positive or negative. If we pay our bills and we do what's right, it can give a very positive witness about the Lord. But when we do not, it leaves such a negative impact. Christian integrity to authorities whom God places in our lives offers a positive witness for Christ. And I know of churches that have left the, the impression in the community that they don't pay their bills. And that leaves such a negative influence on the name of the Lord. And it makes it so hard to be able to witness to people that have run into Christians like that. Isn't that what God has left us here in the world to do? To witness to the world? He's left us here to be his, his light in the world, to share with others his love. He wants us to share his grace and mercy with others. And if we don't live in a way that's a holy life, a pleasing life, a life of integrity, it's going to be awfully hard for us to witness to people that don't know the Lord. That brings us to our next section, which is about love. How better can we show the love of God to people than through sharing the gospel with them? Section 2 in our lesson is entitled, Love Others, verses 8 through 10. Verse 8 we read, Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. As good citizens, we should meet our obligation to others. We should not be known as people that don't pay our debts. It's really beneficial to live a debt-free life. And I encourage you, if you have debts, to get them paid off and live a debt-free life. The emphasis here is more on the debt of love than it is the financial debt, although it's good to be debt-free financially. The emphasis here seems to be about love. In John 13, Jesus talked about that in relationship to our, uh, our way of being presented to the world. He says, starting verse 34, a new command I give you to love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We should be known by our love for each other. As good citizens, we should meet our obligations to one another and one of those obligations is the obligation to love one another. Jesus gave us some good examples of that in his life. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. That was the way that Jesus showed how we should love other people. Uh, Jesus also showed an example of that at the woman at Sychar's well. Uh, he loved others. He loved the world, and we are to follow his example and love others. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. In Matthew uh, chapter 22, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We are to love one another. This is God's commandment to us. Uh, what better citizen could there be than one 
who loves like this. And that kind of brings us to our next point about the anticipation of Christ's return. It begins at verse 11, goes from 11 to 14, anticipating Christ's return. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. When I read that, I thought of a newscaster that keeps saying, oh, we're one day closer to having the COVID-19 uh, situation behind us. Yes, we're one day closer. And what Paul's writing about here, though, is anticipating the coming of Jesus. We're getting closer every day. Here, Paul uses a word picture to get the believers to live out love. He's trying to help them to understand how they should love other people. They knew what the political situation was in Rome. The Romans knew what was going on there. They could anticipate what Rome was going to do. And so Paul says, wake up. You know, pay attention to what's going on. An urgency for them to act is what Paul is trying to get at, that they needed to respond right away, knowing what the temperature was in the society around them. In this verse, he ends with saying, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. What's Paul talking about? Is salvation a process that we have to work on and to eventually be saved? No, that would deny all that Paul wrote about in Romans 1 through 11. He would just discard the whole first part of the book of Romans. Salvation has various aspects or tenses. We've talked about that before. And in this passage, he's talking about something maybe a little different than what we normally think about when we talk about salvation. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, that salvation can be related to the colors of the flag. You remember the red, white, and blue? We always say it that way. And that maybe would help us to remember the various tenses of the word salvation as used in Scripture. In the, the first one was red. In the past tense, which we often think of when we talk about salvation is that's the aspect of justification. That's where we were saved from the penalty of sin. When we received Christ as our Savior, we were saved from the penalty of sin. Christ took that penalty for us. That's where he became the substitute and died on the cross. That's in the past, if you have believed in Christ, you've put your faith in him. If you haven't, I encourage you to do that, to trust Christ for your salvation. That's what the whole first part of this book has been about, the grace and mercy of God, how he has given to us this great gift of salvation. For most of us, at least all of us that are believers, uh, that is past tense. That's something we've already done sometime in the past where we were saved. There's also the, the use of the word salvation in the present tense that's referred to as sanctification, where I'm being saved from the power of sin. We saw that earlier in, in the book of Romans when he talked about dying uh, to sin and coming alive, being raised to, with Christ. Uh, this is where I'm Currently, I'm right now in my life being saved from the power of sin. I don't have to sin. God gives me power over sin to say no to it. So I'm being saved from the power of sin over my life currently. There's also a future tense to the word salvation and that involves glorification when we get to heaven or glory. Uh, there we will be saved from the presence 
of sin. There will be no more sin. It won't be there. So we'll be saved from the presence of sin. There'll be no more temptation. There'll be no more lure to, to do things that are wrong. We'll be saved from that presence of sin. And in this passage, Romans 13, verse 11, that's what it's talking about. The time when we'll go to heaven, we'll be saved from the, the presence of sin. So in that sense, our salvation is closer today than when we believe. Believers are to anticipate the return of Christ. When the rapture happens, we will be taken up to heaven. We'll be glorified. We'll be in his presence. We'll be saved from the presence of sin. If death occurs first, then we'll go directly to heaven. While living as citizens on this earth, we should be looking forward to our home going in heaven when we go to heaven to be with Christ and we'll be saved from the presence of sin that should be something we're anticipating we should be anticipating the return of Christ there we'll see Jesus and there'll be no more sin that should bring hope in our lives that's a great hope for us as believers and it's something we can return or in in appreciation share with others we can help them have that same hope that Christ is coming again to take us to heaven if we've placed our faith in him verse 12 and 13 we read the night is nearly over the day is almost here so let's put on or put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light let us behave decently as in the daytime not in orgies and drunkenness not in sexual immorality and debauchery not in dissension and jealousy in John chapter 3 verse 19 we read this is the verdict that light has come into the world but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil well often evil deeds are done in the cover of darkness and here he's saying don't live that way don't live in sin instead walk in the light live anticipating Christ's return live in a way that when he returns you'll be happy to see him come and he will be able to say well done faithful and good servant uh, demonstrate holy living while we're here in the world we should be showing the world what it means to have Christ as our Savior. We should be living in a way that makes them want to have what we have. Our last verse says, Rather, clothe yourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Instead of living in sin... It says, clothe yourselves with Jesus Christ. In other words, walk in a way that's pleasing to him. It's reminded me of the passage in Colossians. And I wanted to read that as we come to the end of this lesson today. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, we read, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Since we've been raised up with Christ, we're on a new level now. We've received Christ as our Savior. He says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you die, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, repairs, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these anger, 
rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, uh, since you have taken off your old sin uh, self and with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and image of its creator. We're to live for the Lord. We're to set an example before the world that will help to point them to God, help them to want to walk with him and have what we have, that relationship with the Lord. So don't live in sin, gratifying your sinful nature, but rather live a holy life that will draw others to God. What kind of application can we draw from this lesson today? Let me just summarize in this way. First, we're to be kind, the kind of citizens here in the world where God has left us. He could have, at salvation, taken us to heaven, but he didn't. He left us here so we could be witnesses for him. So we want to be the kind of citizens that bring glory to God by submitting to the authorities that he established. Remembering that God is infinite and we're only finite. So we need to believe him and put our faith in him. Walk by faith, not by sight. We are to live a life of love. Uh, fulfilling That will fulfill the law of God and thereby will draw other people to him. We're to anticipate Christ's return by living a holy life that's attracting others to God. Let's be found faithful when he returns. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage of scripture that's a good reminder of how we ought to be living our lives, of life pleasing unto you. Well, thanks for tuning in today. I hope you'll stay safe and pray for one another until we can meet again. Weather permitting, There'll be a drive-in church in the parking lot today. If not, uh, then you'll have to watch it online. The service will be online, whether you come to the parking lot or you don't. It will be online. Until we can meet again, the Lord bless you.